Good evening. Let's begin our worship service tonight, number 364. 364, Standing on the Promises. Good song to start off our Sunday night with, number 364. Standing on the Promises. Number 364, let's sing all four verses. Here we go. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. or a productive or both first of your Sunday afternoon, but we're glad you're back uh, in the Lord's house on this Sunday evening among God's people. I'm going to ask Brother Bill Mallory to open us in prayer tonight. Thank you. You may be seated. All right. We'll give you a chance now to switch over to the Psalter. Our next two songs will come out of the paperback songbook there. And we'll get number 36 to start with there. Number 36. You may remain seated now. My hope is in the Lord. Number 36 in the Psalter. Number 36. All right, here we go. My hope is in the Lord who gave himself for me and paid the price of all my sin at Calvary. For me he died, for me. Life and life. 
Ushers, if you'll come, we'll take our Sunday evening offering. Our offering tonight, as is usual for Sunday night, is for the support of our missionaries. So we ask you to give freely so that we can be, continue to be faithful to them. Just by way of announcement, tomorrow night, Monday, Tuesday, and then again on Thursday night, everything in the offering will go to the INLOs who are with us. The church will give them something, uh, a love offering, but if you'd like to give to them also, then on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday night, uh, we'll be taking an offering for them. Uh, remember to pray for Nathan as he's got a procedure tomorrow. Brother Jeff Braden will be driving back up, I believe, on Tuesday. Uh, there was one other this morning. I don't recall what it was. But uh, here's another one. Brother Chris Rue is over in, U in the Ukraine right now and uh, for a short-term visit, and he sent this text this afternoon and said, We are leaving for Mykolov and Kherson region tomorrow for a few days to get the gospel to previously occupied towns hit hardest by the war. It is all open air preaching and the weather looks bad. Please pray for safety and good weather. Michaelev has been getting hit again uh, along with Odessa. We really appreciate your prayers. So pray for Brother Rue, our missionary in Ukraine, who is over there on a short-term visit right now, trying to see how stable things are. And they're making trips to the battlefront where they have some different churches there and meeting with some people, helping them with some aid and preaching to them. And Brother Rue said earlier this month, he said last trip he went, he saw more people saved in two days than he'd seen in the previously, previous two years. Uh, the war has softened hearts and made people realize how desperate they are and need of God. Uh, pray that that doesn't happen to our country one day because it might be what the Lord needs to do to soften hearts here too. Uh, but pray for Brother Rue, if you would, especially the next couple days as they're doing that. And uh, he'll be with us in April next month, so we'll look forward to hearing a report from this trip when he gets back. All right, Brother Ken, if you would, lead us in prayer, please. Amen. The only announcement we need to make is that in addition to our services every evening this week, Monday through Thursday, we also have Senior Saints. That'll be Tuesday morning downstairs in the Fellowship Hall at 11 o'clock. And so we're looking forward to that meeting. Brother Gary will be back here with us on that morning, Lord willing. And uh, Brother Ionello will be speaking to us on, on uh, uh, Tuesday morning. So those of you that regularly attend, come out and join us. Those that have not attended but are able to, come and join us also. We'd be glad to have you there. At this time, Sister Jennifer Ainello is going to come and sing for us, I believe, right? No? Oh, we got other songs. Okay. At this time, Sarah's going to come and sing. I'm sorry. <laughs>
wander as time hurries on. What have I done with the days come and gone? And I remember how once I was drawn into your sanctuary. When did I wander so far away? How did I get I've nowhere to hide, I've no place to flee, if I ran to you, would you run to me, out from your Let's go ahead and take that Psalter out again, just as we promised. We'll stay in that. We're going to sing, The Bible Stands. The Bible Stands. That is page number four. Page number, I'm sorry, that is not page number four. 19. Page number 19. The Bible Stands. And we'll stand once more. Page number 19. Now the Bible Stands. Let's sing together. The Bible stands like a rock, undaunted mid the raging storms of time. Its pages burn with the truth, eternal, and they glow with the light sublime. The Bible stands, though the hills may tumble, it will firmly stand when the earth shall on its firm foundation. 
So my song this morning was about the Word of God, and my song tonight is about prayer. The two most important things is to read our Bible and to pray, and this is a very convicting song for me, Sweet Hour of Prayer, because rarely do I spend an entire hour. I know I should, but these hymns were written a long time ago when maybe people did that a whole lot better than I do, but I sing it because it's my hope to pray more, pray harder. We have 16 grandchildren, six kids and 16 grandchildren. And some of them are living for the Lord and some of them are not. And it's a heartbreak for any mama or any grandma. So I'm very thankful that the Lord gives us the gift of prayer. And it is a gift. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my father's throne and all my wants and wishes known in seasons of distress and grief my soul has often found relief and oft escaped the tempter snare by thy return sweet hour of prayer sweet hour of prayer sweet hour of prayer thy wings shall my petition bear to him whose truth and faithfulness engage the waiting soul to bless. And since he bids me seek his face, believe his word and trust. His grace I'll cast on him my every care and wait for the sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer. May I thy consolation share Till from Mount Pisgah's lofty height I view my home and take my flight This robe of flesh I'll drop and rise to cease the everlasting prize 
and shout while passing through the air. Farewell, farewell, sweet hour of prayer. Amen. If you haven't already, the Ionellos have a prayer card that's out in the lobby. It's on the ledge on the right as you're going out, and they drop those off so that you could have one of those. Take that home. Put it somewhere conspicuous, maybe in your Bible, somewhere you, where you travel every day, you know, in your Bible, and uh, put it in there, or on the refrigerator. That's usually the other common spot. Uh, but put it on one of those places, and it'll be a, remind, a, a reminder for you to pray for them. So make sure you get one of those if you would, if you haven't already. And then secondly, did everybody get the booklet when they came in? Is there anybody that did not get one of these? We, we printed 80 of them. Brother Bill, if you can help. All right. Jane got one. Anybody else that needs one, need a book? We don't mind if it's husband and wife. We want you to have two because you don't want to cheat off your husband or wife's notes. There will be a test at the end of it. No, there's not. <laughs> but we want you to have the book. There's plenty of them. And so if you didn't get one, make sure you get one. It's got all of the, all of the uh, service, uh, the, the topics for every night starting tonight going through Thursday. Also the outlines in there, and there's plenty of room for you to take notes there. Someone said, I heard recently a, a uh, short pencil is more valuable than a long memory. All right, so write things down because you'll pick up that book maybe six months from now. When something happens at home, you'll say, you know, that preacher talked about that, and you get that book, and it's written down there. Don't trust. I learned a long time ago not to trust my memory. Hopefully you've learned that too. But uh, use that book and take some notes tonight, and, and uh, we'll look forward to what the Lord has. So if you've got that little notebook open and you've got your Bible ready, you've got two-thirds of it ready. Now you need your heart opened as the preacher comes and preaches to us tonight. Brother Ionello, you come ahead, sir. I'm good. Thank you, brother. Again, good to be with you folks tonight. Really looking forward to this conference. Uh, just a little bit of a background as to where all this came from. Um, in uh, the late 1990s, like 1996, um, I was heavily involved with a homeschool group in Middle Tennessee, and they were getting a lot of students from the public school that had been kicked out, uh, girls getting pregnant, boys getting arrested, uh, whatever the case may be, dysfunctional families, dysfunctional kids. And the head of the homeschool asked if I could put together a program to minister to these families, and it was a requirement for them to sit through seven weeks. We called it Seven Steps to Joy seven weeks of teaching just like you're going to be getting tonight um, and we did that and it was amazing we had over a thousand people saved uh, families were restored mothers and fathers and kids weeping at the altar just bawling their eyes out you know just to think about it it was it was incredible God used it in a major way and I hadn't uh, taught it since then because that homeschool we left that, that area of Tennessee and that we're no longer involved with that homeschool group. Um, and then your pastor, just out of the blue, said, I'd like to have a family conference. Do you think you might be able to do it? So this is the first time I'm actually preaching this material. It's not the same material, but obviously some of it I did use. Uh, but since, uh, you know, the late 1990s, so if I'm a little rusty, have mercy on me. Amen. But I want to share with you tonight some, some of the things that help to make a family what God would have it to be. God uniquely made each of you, man and woman. He made you exactly like he wanted you to be. But did you ever realize that you were so different one from another? Men and women are very different. Women get upset at men for not being more like women and men get upset at women for not being more like men. But yet, if you have a cat at home and you throw the ball and you say, go fetch, the cat doesn't fetch the ball and bring it back. Nor does the dog use the litter box like he's supposed to. 
He'll use your carpet, no problem. And you can understand that. You don't get upset by that. Why is that? Because you understand a cat's a cat. And you understand a dog's a dog. And a dog doesn't act like a cat, and a cat doesn't act like a dog. Now, I will tell you that there have been cases in my you know, years as pastoring and ministering that I've seen some men that act like women and some women that act like men. So I, what I'm going to be talking to you about over the course of the next few days is uh, generalities, the, the rule rather than the exception, okay? So understand that because you might say, my husband doesn't act like that, my wife doesn't act like that. Um, I am ta- again, I'm talking more from the general standpoint. So um, it's understandable to you, by, based on the title, that things that are different are not the same. That's a, I mean, if you can't understand what I'm trying to get across just by the title, that's what I'm trying to talk to you about tonight. The difference between man and woman. How God created man, how God created woman. But why do I want to do that? It's one thing to say I'm enduring my spouse. It's another thing to say I'm enjoying my spouse. Big difference. Yeah, I know. They got their quirks. I'm putting up with it. No, that God's, that's not how God intended it. The Bible even says a man that finds a wife findeth a good thing. It's a good thing. So it should be enjoyable, not just something that needs to be endured. Have you, uh, for, I'll give you another example. I mean, if I wanted to race somebody, I'd get a Corvette. You know, I could get a Corvette and I could race somebody. And with that Corvette, I could do zero to 60 in probably four seconds but I would not be able to pull an RV behind it. It's not designed for that. Yet the truck could never do zero to 60 in four seconds, but it could pull 10,000 pounds. Totally different. And so that's where we have to come to tonight. Understanding the differences between man and woman and learning to appreciate it. Appreciate it. Not just put up with it. Appreciate it. You know, it's no different than, uh, you know, think about a, a football team. And a wide receiver, he might weigh 180 pounds. Uh, that wide receiver says, you know, I don't see why that guy always gets to play lineman. I want to play on the line. At 180 pounds, he wants to play center, okay? And the center says, yeah, and I want to be the wide receiver. There's no way that that guy can run. And there's no, no way the other guy can block. Two totally different positions. God designed them uniquely. So you know how God designed man and woman? To be able to fit together perfectly. In other words, guys, without your wife, you're only half a man. There's a whole part of your brain that you're missing. And that is what your wife brings to the table. And vice versa, ladies, there's a whole part of your brain that you're missing when your husband's not there. Two together, boy, that's beautiful. That's how the Lord designed it. Amen? So why do you expect men, ladies, to be like women? And guys, why do you expect women to be like men? We need more knowledge of what the Scripture says. We need more understanding of what the Scripture says. We need more wisdom as to how God created us uniquely. Turn in your Bible to Proverbs chapter 24. Now this is not preaching. This is a conference. So I'm doing more like teaching. So I'm probably not going to get screaming and all that. Until which point I really have to make a point to my own wife. Amen? So, no, nah, I'm only kidding. She's adorable. Uh, Proverbs chapter 24. Look with me if you, at this verse. Through wisdom is a house built it. And by understanding, it is established. And by knowledge, shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. This is all about how to build a home. I've got one question for you. Where's the love? It says, understanding, knowledge, and wisdom. Where's the love? I'm going to tell you something. You're going to probably take two steps back and start throwing things at me. Love's not a requirement for a good marriage. Love is the fruit of a good marriage. 
it's not grown. I mean, it's grown, it's not given. Wisdom comes from understanding. Understanding comes from knowledge. And when you live with somebody with wisdom and knowledge and understanding of the scriptures, you will develop love. Love is a fruit. It grows on that tree. You know, you've heard for, I mean, even back in the old days, they used to have mail order brides for the guys that did the, the gold rush out west and they'd send women over on stagecoach and they get married. They didn't even know each other. But yet they could have a successful marriage using biblical principles. But yet today, you know, a young girl sees a guy, oh, I love him. And he says, oh, isn't she the cutest thing since whatever? And that's what their, their relationship is formed by. It's not formed by knowledge, it's not formed by wisdom, and it's not formed by understanding. And it's difficult, impossible, to build a house without those three things. Most of us would agree that we didn't really know what love was all about when we first got married. Would you not agree? You didn't know what love was about. Let's face it, we were more infatuated one with another than anything. We enjoyed each other's company. It was great. But did we really know what love was about? Because you want to know what love is in accordance to Scripture? It's not 50-50. It's 100-100. Which means when your wife can't give anything, gentlemen, you're to give it all. Ladies, when your husband can't give anything, you're to give it all. That's 100-100. That's how Jesus loved us. He gave it all when we could give nothing. That's the love we're talking about here. And most people would say, 50-50, man, you know, I'll go this far and, and you come the rest. That is not a marriage. That is not love. Love is being willing to give it all when needed. You remember uh, the marriage between Isaac and Rebecca? That was an arranged marriage. Now listen, I'm not up here talking to you about getting arranged marriages. But I am going to tell you that the divorce rate amongst arranged marriages is 6.4%. 6.4. You want to know what the uh, percentage of divorce is amongst those not arranged? The ones that can pick their own spouses? Just under 50%. So what is it that those people that had arranged marriages, what did they have that most people don't have? Wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And that's how the bride was picked for Isaac, with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Love, again, is that byproduct. Love is developed, it is grown, it is nurtured. In, 2000, in uh, 2021, the USA had just under 700,000 divorces. Uh, about half of all marriages end in divorce. And second and third marriages have a 70% failure rate, 73% failure rate. And test driving doesn't help. Living together actually has a higher percentage of divorce than not living together. See, so all the things that make sense to us, what seems logical, what seems right, doesn't add up. The only way to have a successful family, a good home, and a good marriage is to do it God's way. And that means to take knowledge. Take knowledge of what this book, we learned about this this morning. It's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. I can guarantee you it has everything in here you need for a good marriage, if we'll follow it. And we cannot base our marriages based on our feelings. 72%, you know, Divorced couples were interviewed, and 72% of divorced couples said they didn't understand. They didn't fully understand the commitment involved. 72%, three out of four, didn't understand. And what did I just say? How you build a house? Wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. They didn't understand. And that's our, our, our goal, is to understand how God made women, how God made men, so that we can have that happy marriage, so that we can be a great testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. We spend more time educating ourselves for a driver's license or for our careers than we do for our marriage. And guess what? Are you ready for this statistic? Amongst religions, evangelical Protestants have the highest rate of divorce. 
almost three times as much as Hindus. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a high percentage. We're number one. Evangelical Protestants, people that believe the book, people that call themselves Christians, probably most of them being born again, we are number one in the world for divorce. That will go to show you how much the devil is against us. The devil's against us. We are his enemy when we want to have a, a marriage and a family and children that glorify the Lord. So let's start out by looking at point number A in your notes there. Can you appreciate the difference in creation? Like I said, we are fearfully and wonderfully made to be different, to be unique, but to be complementary. The wife should complement her husband, and the husband should complement his wife. So let me tell you, just uh, give you a few things that uh, you might agree with as far as the difference between men and women. Uh, women have a dedicated part of their brain for remembering every outfit they've ever worn, where they wore it, and who they wore it with. Men can't remember what they wore yesterday. Women always compliment other women on their clothing, shoes, and hair. Men don't dare. Women have a built-in system that performs a full-body scan of every woman in the room. When they come in, they get, I watch them. You get a full-body scan, man. I know exactly who she is. I've already sized her up. Men just don't seem to do that. Men are kind of like oblivious. A woman wants to know what to do when someone starts to cry. A man will grab the nearest woman and run. Men will identify the need to find something and say they lost it before they look for it, hoping that their spouse knows where it is. Women will spend 15 minutes looking for something she doesn't even need. Number six, women will often put a stack of things at the bottom of the stairs when tidying up so that they remember to take them up. A man will step over this stack of things thinking they belong there. Men forget almost every special day. Women have a built-in diary that triggers a card alert. A woman will go to the toilet and notice the toilet paper has run out before doing her business. A man will do his business and then notice before shouting for his spouse to bring him some. A man can go into a store, find a pair of shoes, pay and be out in five minutes. A woman will take one hour deciding which of three pairs of shoes she likes the most before buying a pair she then returns. <laughs> if two women and two men went out for dinner together and they all needed to use the restroom, the two women would go together. The second man waits for the first man to come back. Women worry about the future till they get a husband. Men never worry about the future till they get a wife. A man will pay $2 for a $1 item he needs. A woman will pay $1 for a $2 item she doesn't need, but it's on sale. <laughs> men go out to lunch together and start throwing 20s out when it's time to pay the bill, while women bring out their calculators to determine the exact amount each owes. A woman has the last word in any argument. Anything a man says after that is the beginning of a new argument. A woman marries a man expecting he will change, but he doesn't. A man marries a woman expecting she won't change, and she does. A woman knows all about her children. She knows about dentist appointments, romances, best friends, favorite foods, fears, hopes, and dreams. A man is vaguely aware of some short people living in his house. A man has five items in his bathroom, a toothbrush, a shaving cream, a razor, a bar of soap, and a towel. And the average number of items in the typical woman's bathroom is 300 plus. A woman takes days to pack for a trip and is upset that she forgot something. Men pack in 30 minutes and are gone. Looking in the mirror, a woman will see how terrible she looks while a man looks in the mirror and sees the next Arnold Schwarzenegger. Shampoo, men are good if it says shampoo he goes out to buy shampoo he just grab, grabs one that says shampoo women have to find the organic natural rinse free full body shampoo so th there are huge differences behind what makes us tick what makes us ticked off but we have to come to the place of learning to appreciate our spouse so that we can enjoy not just endure so let's look can you appreciate the difference in creation 
The Bible says in Amos 3.3, 3, it says, can two walk together except they be agreed? If you don't get along, you'll soon get along, if you know what I mean. Hit the road. That's usually what happens when couples don't get along. But the Lord has a real sense of humor because he made us so different and yet told us to get along. But you know, the Bible says that a threefold cord is not quickly broken. And those three cords, those are twisted together, cords that are twisted together, very hard to break that cord. I remember we had a, a 800 foot driveway going up a hill and uh, the guy came out to install the telephone line up that hill. I mean, it was, it was high up on that hill. He had 800 plus feet of, of telephone wire. And I noticed he, he opened up one of the wires. There were 18 little wires in there, 18 tiny little ones that you could snap with a finger. But he said, but go ahead and twist them together and now try and break it. 18 of them. You can't break it. You could probably put it behind a car and a car could pull another car with that. And that's because they've been twisted together. And that's how God wants us to be husband and wife twisted together so that it's very hard to pull apart. You know, the Bible says that we are um, fitly framed together to make a house of the Lord. Fitly framed together. He has made your wife to fit with you, gentlemen, and he has made your husband to fit with you, ladies. We just have to learn to appreciate the difference. But you know, the law of physics applies to all. You know, it doesn't matter if you're saved or lost. If you jump off a building, you're going to die. Physics applies to all. But these very, the same rules, that this, the rules that are in this book, a lost person can implement the rules in this book and have a great marriage. I know, I know lost couples that have fantastic marriages. And I know married couples that have terrible marriages. I mean, Christian couples that have terrible marriages. So it's the principles in here. Wisdom, knowledge, understanding. Wisdom, knowledge, understanding. You implement those things found in Scripture, you can build a home the way the Lord would have it to be built. We think differently, we speak differently, we decide differently. Why? Because we're different. It's not always right and wrong, but just different. It's not always agreeing or disagreeing, but understanding. You know, I'm, I have certain quirks. I like all my shirts hung up with the opening of the shirt facing to the left. And I want them color coordinated. That's how my wife hangs them up in the closet for me. I go take a shower. She likes the shampoo bottle label to face outward. She doesn't want the back of the bottle to be the first thing you see. She wants the front of the bottle, so I accommodate her. I tell her, I like toilet paper when the toilet paper comes over like a waterfall. I don't like to have to reach behind to find out where it is. I want it over the front like a waterfall, so she puts that on there for me. She says, I want you to put the spices in the, in the pantry. I want you to put them in there alphabetically so it's easy for me to find. When I need pepper, I can find pepper. When I need cumin, I can find cumin. It's right there, so put them in there alphabetically. So I do that for her, and she does things for me. We learn to work together to be fitly joined together. Men's brains think compartmentally. Men are made rationally, ladies. They think with facts from the head. Facts from the head. We are simple. Let me say that to you again, ladies. We are simple. I'm sure you already know that. That's part of the problem you have with us, is that we're simple. But we, our brain is made up of lots of little boxes. We have lots of little boxes. And we only use one box at a time. And we e even have a box that's called the nothing box. And the nothing box is when we're sitting in front of the TV with our mouths just hanging open. That's the nothing box. We're nowhere. We're not thinking of anything. We're gone. We're, we're to, to, tuned out to the world, tuned out to you, tuned out to the kids, tuned out to everything. We're in our nothing box. We're playing Tarzan, John Wayne, and Batman. And we're trying, you know, 
we're, we're imagining that we're something that we're not. But it's fun, okay? And But well, while we're in that nothing box, nothing else goes on. And then when we're done with that, we take out another box. It's like a filing cabinet with, with files in it. We'll take out one file at a time. You know, and that's not how women are made. Their women are made, their, their brain is a big ball of wire with all these wires shooting out all over the place. And she's able to think of the kids, Walmart, money, health, mom, dad, over there. She can do it all at the same time. Men can't do that. I mean, my wife can ask me, honey, do you remember what I told you five minutes ago? I go, no. She said, I just, I just got done telling you. I know, but I was thinking about something else. And I hadn't put away that file yet. When that file gets put away, then you can tell me what you need to tell me because I can only do one thing at a time. And women are totally different. They're multitasking. When my wife comes into, if I'm watching a show or something on TV, I say, honey, come on in here. I think you'd enjoy this show. She'll come in there. She'll sit down. She'll have her phone in this hand. She'll be texting. She'll have a book open on her lap. She'll be, you know, actually talking. As some of these times, she's talking to a person. And then all of a sudden, I don't like the TV show anymore, and I go to change it. She goes, why'd you change that? I was watching that. How can you do all that at the same time? She goes, I am, I am. I can't do that. Men aren't designed to do that. We do one thing at a time, ladies. So forgive us, we are simple. Ah, I remember saying to my wife one day, we were walking through an antique store, and I said, man, that is a beautiful painting. That would look great in our living room. She says, it is in our living room. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How many times, gentlemen, have you seen your wife in a dress you really liked? You say, oh, I love that dress. Is that new? No, I've worn it 10 times already, you know? And it, it's just because that, fi that file wasn't out. We were somewhere else at that time, and we couldn't think that way. We don't think the same. But yet, where how we think is very factually. And sometimes you have to be factual from the head and not feelings from the heart. Women obviously are based, they're very feelings oriented. And th that's a good thing. You say, well, oh yeah, you're not supposed to you know, rely upon your feelings. I know, but God still gave us feelings. We have to deal with our feelings. And you know, the those two things together, boy, they work out so well together. How many times has uh, your husband, you know, um, you know, said something he shouldn't have said? It, he didn't, it didn't occur to him. He just said it, but he, he knows it hurt one of the kids' feelings or whatever. And mom's right there, and she picks up on all of that because she's feelings-oriented. And she takes her husband aside and says, listen, big boy, uh, you just hurt your daughter's feelings. You need to go in there and say you're sorry. You know, they see things from a different standpoint than we do. And again, it's designed to complement one another. Isn't it true, guys, that you can walk right past the garbage that needs to be taken out and not even notice it? My, I mean, our garbage gets, you want, you want to know when our garbage gets taken out? When my wife says the garbage needs to get taken out. So, you know, you would think that I, living in that house, would look down, see that bag totally full, and say the garbage needs to be taken out. But that file is not out right now. The file I'm thinking about is, you know, the next message I'm going to preach or, well, you know, I need, to, I need to counsel this couple over here or whatever the case may be. My head is somewhere else. But thank God that women have that brain that can multitask and can handle doing many things at once. Because I can tell you this, there is no way on earth I would want to be a mother. Mothers do, I mean... She's eating lunch while going to the bathroom, wiping a kid's nose, and, you know, talking to her mother on the phone, all at the same time. I can't do that. It would drive me crazy. I do one thing. I try and do one thing. I do it well, and then I move on to the next thing. So, again, try and understand how we think. Women, number two, women's brains, they think globally. Women are made emotionally. They think with feelings from the heart. Again, men have tunnel vision and focus on one thing at a time, but a woman has 360-degree radar. She knows what's going on around her at all times. And again, that's a real blessing. Men, um, uh, we have that single-tasking brain versus hers. You know, ask a lady to describe the perfect husband. 
and she describes another woman. I want a man that is sensitive, communicative, tender, and a good listener. <laughs> you don't want a man, you want another woman. Because that's not who a man is. And we have to come to the place of learning to appreciate what we are individually as man and woman. You know, um, a husband and wife can have a fight before bed. You know the husband will wake up and everything's just fine. Good morning, honey, how you doing? She's ready for round two. Because she didn't forget about it. Why? Because that feeling is still there. And it has to be dealt with. All right, let's look at can you appreciate the difference in communication? Can you appreciate the difference in communication? Men use language to report. Women use language to build rapport, to build relationships. A woman holds eye contact for an average of 12 seconds. Ladies, that's four times longer than the average man holds eye contact. We hold eye contact for three seconds on average. And then we're on to something else. We're looking somewhere else. You know, it, it, ladies are trying to build rapport. Men just want the bottom line. The average woman speaks 25,000 words in a day. That's a lot of words. The average man speaks half that, 12,500. And he uses 12,495 of those at work. And he comes home and she says, how is work? Fine. What's for dinner? Good night, honey. That's about it. And men don't have that desire to, again, there are exceptions to the rule, but typically men don't have a, a desire to sit down and just talk. My, I, my wife will say, honey, can we talk? Let's not watch a show tonight. Let's, let's talk. I say, about what? You know what she says? Anything. Anything. How do you just talk about anything? So that's it. Women just want to have that time to talk. And they want that eye contact. So it's important, gentlemen, that we understand that. You know, you ask the average woman why they talk so much, and it's because they have to repeat everything three times. 70% of what is said to the opposite sex is either misunderstood or not heard at all. 70%, folks. Misunderstood or not heard at all. That's why men prefer the headline, women prefer the story. It's like the difference between reading a book and reading the cliff notes. Men are cliff notes, women are the novels. Understand? The neighbor's dog ran away, says your wife to you. He does not care about all the steps they've taken to find Fifi. You know, he doesn't care that they put, sent out a team, they canvassed the entire neighborhood, they went from door to door, from here all the way down to Walmart and back, looking for Fifi, they called the police. They, he doesn't care about all that. You gave him the, the headline, Fifi is gone. That's all he wants. And that's the difference between men and women. When it comes to communication, women have an eight-lane highway, but men have nothing but a country back road. Ladies, you need to know that's why men interrupt 75% of the time and finish your sentences, because they want the bottom line. That's how God created them. Men just want the bottom line. Give me the facts. What's the bottom line? Uh, <laughs> I started to teach this last year up in Rochester where I'm from, and uh, I shared this, and one of the couples that I had known for years came up and said, my wife came up to me last week and said, I've got 10 reasons as to why we should do this. And uh, her husband said, okay, what are they? The first reason she gave him, he said, I agree totally, let's do it. He got up, walked away. She said, you get back here. I've got nine more to tell you. It didn't matter the fact that he had already agreed and everything was fine. Good, do it. She wanted him to hear all 10 reasons. 
And that's the difference between men and women. When men give directions, we give streets and mileage, while women give landmarks like Walmart and Walgreens. Listening requires undivided attention. These things destroy relationships, destroy communication. I've watched young kids sitting in an airport, all going to the same place, a big school convention or whatever. They were sitting in an airport with the seats facing each other, and kids straight across from each other, they were texting each other. They couldn't talk. That's the society we live in today. These things are destroying communication. When I talk to my wife, if I'm on this phone, I'll notice after about five minutes, after I pull that file folder back out, that she has stopped talking. And I say, honey, what, finish what you were saying. No, I'm not going to. What? Finish what you were saying. No. As long as that thing there is more important than talking to me, I'll wait until you're done with that thing, then I'll continue my conversation. And if you're really interested in talking to me, you will look at me. Eye-to-eye -eye contact, rather than having my attention focused on this. Gentlemen, women love relationships, and she wants to know that she is more important to you than any other person on this earth. And the best way to communicate that is eye-to-eye -eye communication and talking. And I know it doesn't come naturally for us, but some things can be learned. You know, after you first got saved, was it natural for you to witness to people? No. Right after you got saved? No. It took time. You know, and all the things that God required, like tithing and praying and reading your Bible every day, those things took time as you developed it. But yes, habits can be changed. And it's very, very important to women that communication be personal, eye to eye. You know, one of the uh, big things, too, is don't communicate sensitive matters by text or email. Sensitive matters need to be said personally so they can hear, see your face, hear your voice inflection, your tone. That's all part of communication. So here's a text. A wealthy woman who was traveling overseas saw a bracelet she thought was irresistible. So she sent her husband this cable, have found a wonderful bracelet price $75,000. May I buy it? Her husband promptly wired back this response, no comma, price too high. But the cable operator omitted the comma. So the woman received this message, no price too high. Yeah, communication is so important. One missing comma can send the wrong message. You know, isn't it true? I mean, if you learn a language, aren't you really proud of yourself when you're able to then communicate with somebody from a foreign country and communicate your idea and, and get it across to them? And you say, man, yes, it's working. I can do it. And so you're, you're there and you say, buenos dias, or buongiorno, or guten morgen, or bonjour. And you're proud of yourself. Well, guess what? Ladies, you need to learn manese. And guys, you need to learn womanese. And bottom line, there's nothing easy about either of them. It takes work. It takes work. All right, let's look and see what men should do to make communication a little better. Increase historical detail, gentlemen. She needs more of the story, okay? So um, move slowly to the bottom line. Let them get involved. Let them feel like they're part of that conversation and part of your day. Give more background or context, such as describe. Don't just say, you know, how was your day at work? Fine. She wants more than that. She wants to know what, uh, what uh, route you took to get to work. She wants to know, what did you do at work today? What challenges did you face today? Who did you have lunch with? What did you have for lunch? Was it a good day? Was it a bad day? She wants to know all that. And when you just say fine, it shuts her off and basically says, close your mouth. And we can't do that. Not to have the marriage that the Lord 
would want us to have. Remove all distractions. Remove these things. Remove TVs. Remove PCs. Give her your undivided attention. Ask questions. How about that, guys? I know, when you ask a question, you're going to get more words. I understand that. But that's what they need. Especially when they work with kids all day long. You know, and now all of a sudden they have an opportunity to talk to a human being. And we need to be better listeners. So ask questions and listen sincerely. And like I said, maintain eye contact. All right, what should women do to improve communication? Give the bottom line first. Before you go through the entire story, give the bottom line first. And then ask them if they want more detail. They'll be happy to tell you. Resist thinking that he doesn't care. Okay? Resist also thinking that he needs the context and the background. He doesn't need it. Now, he may say, yeah, honey, go ahead and share with me the whole story because he wants to give you an opportunity and it bonds the two of you together, but he definitely does not need the entire novel. He's a Cliff Notes guy. Don't hint, be direct, and state your desire. In other words, ladies, don't say, I sure am hungry and we have nothing at home to eat. You know, just say, honey, would you like to go out to dinner? Just get right to the bottom line. Then rather than hinting around, because guys, you know, we're simple. I said it, we're simple. And we don't always pick up on your clues. So it's important for you to be direct. But don't be pushy or aggressive. He's not another woman. He's a man. And lastly, respect and appreciate his input, even if you don't agree with it. It may be totally different than how you see things. It's a different viewpoint. Doesn't the Bible say there's great safety in a multitude of counselors? A man has a different viewpoint. He looks at things differently than does a woman. So it's not necessarily wrong. It's just different. And you would be doing yourselves a big favor if you not consider it wrong. Okay, let's look at, can you appreciate the difference in conflict? In conflict. Look in your Bible at Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs chapter 14. And in verse 4, the Bible says, Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increase is by the strength of the ox. Now, the ox is a, a, a worker, he's a laborer, and oftentimes the Bible refers to that man as being an ox. Definitely refers to your pastor as being an ox. But notice it says, where there is no ox, the crib is clean. What happens when the ox comes on the scene? Now you got ox poop. Ox poop. And we all understand what ox poop is. But you have to understand that, you know, the only way that two people can dwell together for years and years and never have an argument is if they share the same hearing aid. There's going to be ox poop. And you need to know how to handle ox poop. It's important. Because you're going to have it. Mountains and molehills. You take a pebble, put it on the back of a butterfly, it can't fly. You put it on the back of an elephant, he won't even know it's there. Gentlemen, you can handle things differently. Conflict affects you differently than it affects her. She's an emotional being. A, a fight with her husband could crush her, crush her for days, maybe weeks. But for you, the next day, hey, honey, what's, what's going on? Uh, can I get my coffee? You know, you're totally oblivious to it. Totally pass it right by. We're different. Again, we think basically on facts. They think with feelings. We're more, more from the head. They're more from the heart. When there's a problem, men want to solve it. Did you hear me, ladies? Men want to solve the problem. Women don't necessarily want you to solve the problem. They want to share the problem. They want to talk about it. 
They don't necessarily want a solution. Now, I don't get that. That does not compute in my brain. If there's a problem, let's fix it. If there's a problem, let's get rid of it. But that's not, you know, my wife has told me many times, honey, do you know what she's afraid of? She's afraid I'm going to grab this, and in two seconds, I'll be on this thing, like white on rice. You know, she's telling me, but this happened with, you know, brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. Oh, really? Oh. And I'm right after it. What do I want to do? I want to fix the problem. Why do I want to fix the problem? So I can put that file folder away. She doesn't want me to put that file folder away. She wants to talk about it for a while and share it. That's how she bonds with her man. She shares. We bond with our wives by trying to alleviate your problems. Take those burdens off of you, fixing the problem. Men like playing Superman and John Wayne and Tarzan. Men like to feel like they're your heroes. But ladies, uh, again, she doesn't want it fixed. She wants you to feel it as well. You know, but uh, when there's conflict, Women can give uh, one-word answers as well, such as, what's the matter, honey? Nothing. Now, if you believe that, when she says nothing, if you believe that, just start walking around the house whistling. Because it's really hard to whistle with a fat lip. Amen? Yes, there is something wrong. But she wants to know that you know her, that, that you care, that you want to bring it out. That, that takes sitting down. That takes eye to eye. That takes conversation. And that's how women are made. That's how men are made. When she's not talking, she's still communicating. Cupboard doors, house doors, footsteps, plates, dishes, silverware. It's all a means of communicating. And guys, we need to be more in tune with what, again, makes her tick, what makes her ticked off. But guys, in the middle of conflict, what do we do? We play lawyer. Oh yeah, well, let's, let's look at the facts. She doesn't care about your facts because she's dealing with her feelings. The facts are, okay, this is what the jury says, this is what the witnesses say. The judge now has rendered a verdict that I'm innocent. That's great, you jerk. Sleep on the couch. She doesn't care. She doesn't care. She wants to know that you care about her, not that you have a solution to the problem. You see the difference between the two. Ben Franklin used to say, on this point I agree, but on the other, if you don't mind, may I take exception. There's a good way and a bad way to say, I don't agree with you, you're a stu stupid idiot. Uh, ben Franklin said it in a much more uh, pleasing way. So, uh, one secret of successful conversation is learning to disagree without being disagreeable. Who's right? Who's wrong? Sometimes it's just a matter of compromise. Did you ever realize that both people could be wrong in conflict? Both? Husband and wife could be wrong? Maybe the husband was wrong in what he did, and the wife was wrong in how she handled it, how she addressed it, how she communicated it to her husband. Both people can be wrong in a problem. Remember uh, Ahab, one of the wickedest kings Israel ever had? It says, whose heart Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. Well, was Ahab wrong for doing the things he did? Absolutely. Was Jezebel wrong for having stirred up her husband's heart? Absolutely. They were both wrong. So it's not a matter of who's right and who's wrong. Sometimes it's just being different. That's why the Bible says esteeming others better. Uh, the wives, you need to esteem your husband better than you. Gentlemen, you need to esteem your wife better than you. A lot of problems. How many problems would you actually have in a marriage if each spouse thought more of the other person than they did themselves? You'd never have any problems. You'd never have any problems. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, and look at verse 15. The Bible says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, 
from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. There's the love. Now we're seeing the love coming. And love will grow. Love will grow. And that you, you people that have been married for years and years and years and years, you can probably attest to the fact you love your wife more today than when you first met her. You've grown. Your love has grown. By, by how? Wisdom, knowledge, understanding. And that's just not wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of this book. It's wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of your spouse. Because every spouse is different. Amen? The Bible says in Colossians 4, 6, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how. There's the key word. Not what. It's not what you say sometimes. It's not when you say it sometimes. Sometimes it's how you said it. How you ought to answer every man. You know, it, it would be a good idea if we were to, um, you know, how many, I don't know how many times I've assembled something for my kids for Christmas. And I'm sitting there on Christmas Eve underneath the Christmas tree and I'm putting a bicycle together or, you know, some motor car or whatever the case may be. And I get all done with the thing and I get up off the floor and I see a part that was underneath me sitting there on the floor that is integral to this thing working. And I have to disassemble the whole thing because it was supposed to go on on step two. I have to take it all apart and put it all back together again. Why? Because I didn't read the instructions. And folks, we don't need to, you know, go through divorces and all the rest of that if we just would take the time to read the instruction manual, get the wisdom we need, get the knowledge we need, get the understanding we need so that we can live with our wives and our husbands joyfully. That's how God intended it. That's how God intended it. All right. Can you appreciate the difference in concerns? Her concerns are different than your concerns, gentlemen. You know, think about it. I, I can tell you right now. So my wife and I, we try to travel, you know, 300, 350 miles a day in the RV, pulling a car. Uh, we have gone as far as 700 miles in a day. Boy, that was a day. But uh, my goal, when I get behind that wheel, I want to get my 300 miles in. She wants to stop at every Goodwill, every Cracker Barrel, and every antique shop along the way. My goals in my destination are different than her goals in her destination. And it's important that we understand and appreciate the difference. You know what she's trying to build? Memories. You know what I'm trying to build? Miles. And the memories are just as important as the miles. Men are future and women are present. The, gentle, the man says, honey, we're moving. And his wife says, what about the kids, the car, the dog, and my mother? Honey, I'm starting a new business and we'll be set for life. Great, take out the garbage when you go. She lives in the here and the now. He lives out there in the future. That's why he can watch John Wayne and John Wayne's riding along on the plains and all you can see is just open wilderness, no houses, no people, just openness, and he's riding, and we're John Wayne, and we're going, ah, oh, this is so peaceful. We live out there. She lives here, today, now. The kids, my mom, the money, my mother. And we're saying, oh, one day, real soon, in the near future, we'll be set for life. Totally different. Both are necessary. Both are needed. The prudent man foreseeth the evil afar off. He has to look into the future. But it's also important that we take care of today, the here and the now. Gentlemen don't like receiving directions, especially from their wife. You know, honey, I think you're going the wrong way. Are you kidding? I know exactly where I am. I know where I'm going. I don't need a map. Until which time you figure out you're lost, you have to pull over and figure it out. But we don't like to typically receive instruction from our wives because it's a, obviously a pride thing.
But the Bible tells us to leave and cleave. How does that happen? You learn to love what your spouse loves. Learn. Learn. Jenny is learning to love sushi and westerns. I'm learning to love Hallmark movies and goat cheese. We like different things, but I get more into her world when I'm trying to enjoy the things she enjoys. She's trying to get more into my world when she's trying to enjoy the things I enjoy. And there's a lot of things we both love doing. We love you know, grabbing a cup of coffee and going antique shopping and just walking through, going back 40 and 50 years as we walk down the aisles and look at things that we had when we were little kids. You know, it's just, it's enjoyable, it's fun, and it's where we bond and we come together. Learning to love what each other loves. You know, versus saying, I don't like doing that. If you want to go, you go by yourself. I'll see you here when you get home. So it's important. It's important to send that message that you love or are trying to love what they love. All right. Letter E, can you appreciate the difference in care? In care. Ladies, did you know that men thrive off of admiration and respect? You tell a man that that shirt looks so handsome on you, he will wear that thing until there's holes in it. He will. And he'll wear it till it stinks. But you'll have to tell him. And, or tell your husband, oh, I love that cologne you're wearing. He'll, wear, he'll go through that thing bottle after bottle after bottle. You know why? He loves to be made to feel special by his wife, by his spouse. And it's, it goes both ways. You know, you've never seen yet a cheerleader on the, on the sidelines of a football game booing their team. Your wife, you're to be a cheerleader to your husband. Gentlemen, you're to be a cheerleader to your wife. You know, I love the fact that my wife just started last year playing the guitar because we'd go to so many churches that didn't have an accompanist. They didn't have a piano player. They didn't have any. So she, had, she said, I can't sing a cappella. I don't want to sing a cappella. So I need to learn to play the guitar. So at 72 years old, oh, I'm sorry, honey, uh, 62 years old, she started playing the guitar. And she's taught herself how to play it in case wherever we are, they don't have somebody that can play. I'm, pr I'm proud of her for that. You know, going above and beyond uh, just to try and meet the needs of other people. So appreciating the, the difference in care. Men thrive off of admiration and respect. They love that. And women thrive off of thoughtfulness. Thoughtfulness. Women love that. You know, we men, we think big. All right, I'm going to show my wife I love her. I'm going to take her on a cruise, buy her a diamond ring, and we'll go to Ruth Chris Steakhouse for Valentine's Day. All these big things. That's not what means, I mean, sure, I'm sure she enjoys that, but it's the day-to-day, -day, the week-to-week -week thoughtfulness of just cutting out a portion of your schedule for her. Yeah, every Friday night, honey, is our date night. Every Friday night, I'm going to take you out for dinner. We'll get a babysitter, whatever. We'll go out and we'll have a good time. And she will look forward to that all week long. I remember a time that I, we didn't even have money. We were, you know, very poor, not doing well at all financially. And she'd say, let's just go to McDonald's. We'll get a hot fudge sundae at McDonald's. It's a dollar each. It's two dollars. Let's go. Let's do that. Let's go get a hot fudge sundae. She, she didn't have to be a $150 dinner at Ruth Chris. She was happy with a one dollar hot fudge sundae. You know what she wanted? She wanted to be thought of. She wanted me to cut out a portion of my life, a portion of my schedule, and place her in that special spot and say nothing else is going to get in the way of that. I'm not going to call up and say, hey, honey, I would have loved to take you out tonight, but the guys called me and asked me if I could shoot 18 holes with them. So, you know, maybe we can do it tomorrow. Wrong. Big time wrong. Isn't it, guys? Big time wrong. Yeah. She needs to feel like she's number one in your life. Obviously, other than the Lord, but number one in your life. After a long day, again, I'm, 
I'll just like to sit down and watch a movie and relax or whatever. Uh, and, but uh, Jenny wants to talk. And that's, that's how they knit, gentlemen. That's how they bring relationships together. The Bible tells us in Colossians 2.19, And not holding the head, from which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment, ministered and knit together, increases with the increase with God. Increase with the increase in God. Okay, watch this now. Watch. Men and women, husband and wives, don't get closer like this. Husbands and wives get closer like this. They increase with the increase in God. The closer you get to God, look what's happening, the closer you're getting to each other. And that's what you need to do. Please the Lord first. Ladies, you submit unto your husbands as unto the Lord. Gentlemen, you love your wives as Christ loved the church. We do it as unto the Lord. And that's how we get closer together. That's how we become knit together. Did you know that married people make more money, live happier, live healthier, and live longer than unmarried people? Sounds like a win, 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 win to me. And that threefold cord is not quickly broken. Remember. All right, and the last point tonight, the companion's sacrifice. What did Je Jesus say in John 15, 13? Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You know what that's called? Surrender. It's called yielding. It's called giving way. You know, just like you do, gentlemen, when you walk up to a door and there's a lady right behind you, you'll open the door and you yield. And she goes through the door behind you, or in front of you. Yes, it's surrendering one to another and giving up what might be really important to you today for them. Like, you know, there are times that I just want to come home and I want to crash. I'm exhausted. The day was long. It was a hard day. I'm just looking forward to going home and sitting in my lazy boy chair. So appropriately named. Lazy boy chair. And reclining back, and that's the end of my day. And I can just tell that my wife would love to just take a drive, grab a coffee, you know, maybe grab an ice cream, just spend some time together and get out of the house. So yeah, laying down your life, it's not always dying. Sometimes it's living, to be a living sacrifice, as the Bible says in Romans 12 to give of yourself, to esteem others better, to yield your desires and your rights for them. And ladies, the same thing for you. Maybe you were really looking forward to getting out today and your husband comes home and you can tell he is exhausted. The last thing you want to do is open up a novel and start telling him all about your day. He's exhausted. And for you to step back and say, you know, I really feel sorry. He's a hardworking man. He just needs to rest tonight. I can put off what I want till tomorrow. That's how we build relationships. That's how we knit together. When we esteem others better, preferring one another over ourselves. Again, that marriage is 100-100. It's not 50-50. When your spouse can't give anything at all, you'll have to give 100%. And to be friends. Here's the definition of friends. A friend is someone who knows all about you and likes you anyway. A friend is one before whom you may think aloud with no fear of offense, apology, or forgiveness. Sometimes I'll tell my wife, I said, honey, don't, don't take this as gospel. I'm thinking out loud. I'm throwing out some ideas that are in my head. I'm just thinking out loud. I want to be able to do that without fear of upsetting her. And so she takes that, and she understands. He's, you know, he's not saying anything declarative, making any hard and fast statements. He's just thinking out loud. But a friend enables you to do that without suffering the consequences. A friend is one who stays with you when all others leave. Like everyone forsook Paul in that prison cell, but notwithstanding, the Lord stood with him. A friend is one who knows all about you and loves you just the same. 
A friend is one who goes around saying nice things about you behind your back. A friend is one who does his knocking before he enters instead of after he leaves. Yeah, a friend. And that's the purpose of tonight's uh, message, was just to understand the differences between man and woman. When you can understand, then maybe you can start to appreciate better why God made men the way they are, why God made women the way they are. And he designed it for us to come together and to be one and to live together pleasantly. The Bible says how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. And it starts right in our homes. If our marriage isn't what it should be, we're sending the signals down to our children we're sending it to others around us. I have a cousin that refuses to get married. He's 67 years old. He's never been married his whole life. Why? Because his mother had a terrible marriage and his sister had a terrible marriage. And he says, I would rather have none of that. So he just chose to never get married his whole life. And we don't want to send that message. We want to send the message that what God designed, he, God designed it, that it's beautiful. And it can be a tremendous testimony of what the Lord Jesus Christ would have for us. So tonight, I don't know what kind of invitation pastor wants to have. If it's just a matter of coming to an old-fashioned altar with your wife and just saying, honey, I'm going to try to understand you better as you try and understand me better, that we can be a better testimony to our kids and those around us. I just want to, I want to have the marriage that God would intend for us to have. And that starts with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of exactly how God made you and who you are to me. Preacher? All right, thank you, Brother Ionel. Let's all stand together this evening. <clears throat> just play 270, just as I am. We're not going to sing a song. We're just going to stand. We're going to bow our heads. We're going to let Anna play. And if the Lord has challenged you, if the Lord has softened your heart, the Lord has, has given you a, an understanding. Um, we're not saying, I'm not saying this, you need to come if you have a bad marriage because that wouldn't be a good invitation to give. But I'm saying this, if you, if you see, you can do more to make your marriage better. All right, uh, a lot of the things he talked about, you say, I'm doing that. Husbands say, I'm, I'm trying to do that. Wives, I'm doing that. All right, we, we are. But... Uh, I don't want to confess too much in front of you right now, uh, but I'm not, I'm not doing it as well as I could do. And so tonight the invitation might just be this. Let's, let's, uh, let's pray together, husbands, wives, thinking about one another. How much more could we do to be a blessing and a help to one another for the cause of Christ? So, Anna, if you'll just play. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed, and you just talk to the Lord. If you want to use the altar, that's fine. If you want to come and pray, that's good. <clears throat> 